Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Ladies and gentlemen, it is I, yet again, your friendly neighborhood moviegoer, John L. And I'm here to talk about a movie I watched last night, or should I say yesterday afternoon, entitled Babylon. Babylon is a film directed by Damien Chazelle, who also directed Oscar-winning film La La Land. This film hit wide release as of today, December 23rd, 2022, and it's distributed by Paramount Pictures. The runtime, a hearty three hours and nine minutes. Whew. What am I to say about this film? It has been spoken about in movie circles for months now. It has been a much anticipated film to be released. And it is in awards contention, like a lot of the movie fair is towards the end of the year. The first time I watched the trailer for this movie, I was enamored, locked in. I said, this looks like a wild ride, and I'm here for it. The movie stars such actors and actresses as Brad Pitt, Margot Robbie, Gene Smart, Tobey Maguire. We had a starring role for Diego Calva and Joe Van Adepo, along with uh, Lee Jun Lee. So when I first sat in the movie theater, I thought to myself, okay, pretty good crowd, full theater, not really much buzz, though. I felt like folks were preparing, not for the worst, but they were just getting mentally prepared for whatever was coming. I went to my local Alamo Draft House, had some nice fish and chips, during the, uh, the trailers. And once the trailers was over, that movie started. I would say that the film was wildly ambitious. The imagery, the cinematography, the color palette, the score, the music, and a lot of the performances were very strong in good and bad ways. Let me mention the good. I think the performances from Diego Calva, uh, Margot Robbie, Gene Smart was amazing in this movie. Lee Jun Lee super uh, alluring and enticing. She played her role to a T. A lot of the secondary cast members, a lot of familiar faces, uh, such actors as uh, Ethan Supley or Supley. I, uh, 
I popped when I saw Eric Roberts pop up as the father of Margot Robbie's character. And I think a lot of what we captured in that movie theater uh, outside of just the sheer volume of visual tantalization was trying to understand the narrative of the movie. That's part of the bad. Let me continue with the good. Performances. Brad Pitt, great. Margot Robbie, I feel, and I'm not sure if anybody's said this as of yet, not to say that the performance was bad, I just feel like she's been typecast as of late. She is, uh, I get to use a, a phrase, she's, she's famous for portraying a comic book character, Harley Quinn, uh, from the Batman universe, the Joker's main squeeze and love interest. Uh, Harleen Quinzel, Harley Quinn, is a character that has her very impulsive, crazed, and violent moments. So the portrayal of the character really does transcend or lend into the character that she portrayed in this movie, Nellie Leroy, sends the violence. It was really more the, the high energy, impulsive, semi-erratic, or should not even semi, erratic behavior, and just wanting to be the center of attention. You guys ask, why is she the center of attention? Let me give you the quick synopsis on the movie. The synopsis reads that this is a tale of outsized ambition and outrageous excess. It traces the rise and fall of multiple characters during an era of unbridled decadence and depravity in early Hollywood. Which is true. The synopsis is dead on. As per how Damien Chazelle, the director, put this together, is another thing altogether. I think the movie was beautifully shot. Like I said, the score was amazing. The performances were top notch. How they pieced the story together is what really faulted this movie for me. It just seemed much more crazed than it needed to be. The movie itself didn't need to be put together in what seemed to be in a haze. I understand, or at least my perception is, that you wanted to give the feel of all this excess and depravity and debauchery and the swinging and the and roaring 20s. You gave that off, but you failed 
to keep, at least me, keep me completely engaged, you lose me a lot of the time during this movie. And we're going to go into the negatives now because there ain't much positives that I can speak to outside of what I've already uh, described. The storyline follows all these characters, their ups and downs, their ambitions, their obsessions, their uh, habits, good and bad, dreams, and ultimately the sad look at the transition from the silent film era into what was then called the talkies and film in technicolor. All those things were hit throughout the movie, but they weren't woven into the narrative in a way that not that it didn't make sense there just wasn't much cohesion in it it wasn't well put together usually as we all know art is subject to interpretation which is why they say um, opinions on art are subjective. And even though Damien Chazelle had this very grand ambition and the film feels grand, but it just doesn't land. There was too much going on. A lot of the time, I found what was going on to be unnecessary in a movie in which lasts three hours and nine minutes, you feel the three hours and nine minutes. I was at times wondering, when is this going to end? Because it was just super, very overwhelming. And not from a storyline standpoint. It's just what they hit you with visually and from a conceptual standpoint. I understand art to be something that comes from one's imagination. But movies are supposed to tell stories, right? And this particular movie was trying to tell too many stories at the same time, which just leads to a clusterfuck of confusion. There were points, and I'm not too sure if this was due to bad editing or just overly stylized transitions but I felt like some of the oh man some of the exposition from the characters in certain scenes didn't lend to what had just happened in a previous moment so some of it was out of sync it's like, okay, we're now in this scene where we have one of the protagonists, the male protagonist and the female protagonist in a car. They're sharing a moment, but we just came out of something with another one of the main protagonists who was having some sort of a crisis. And I understand there are ebbs and flows to things. 
but it's like if the moments made sense from an overall feel standpoint, I would have thought better of it, but I didn't because I felt like the sequence of that scene just didn't correlate with what happened before. And that's what really got me out of the movie. Secondarily, I'll say this. I'm all for certain levels of imagery, right? I think I've mentioned this before to everyone where I'm not a big fan of horror or gore or body horror and things of that nature, right? And or really are like mutilation type stuff or like dark no like real dark noir. There were scenes put together in the movie. Spoiler alert. During Tobey Maguire's, I would say, 10 to 15 minute appearance in this movie. Where I said to myself, where is this going? Why is this important? How does this, all this, lend to the narrative? And I felt like it was just a visual exposition of something that was in the director's mind. And they just wanted to put it on screen. Toby Maguire's character, to me, was completely useless in this film. Made no sense. And that's harsh to say, because I'm not saying that Toby Maguire's portrayal of the character was bad. It wasn't, but I've seen him do better. But the director's choice to put that character in the movie yet again to me, was a bad one. And the scenes were just, they weren't necessary. It wasn't needed for the grander story that was being told. It was great for me to see Ethan Supley in the movie because I, I've grown up watching him on TV uh, from... Boy Meets World, Earl, and whatever else he's been in throughout the years. But because he was part of Tobey Maguire's entourage, he got lost in that kerfuffle. And it sucked for me. Eric Roberts, another actor whose portrayal as the father of Margot Robbie. <laughs> he, much like his daughter, always wanted to be the center of attention, which is why you understand where Margot Robbie's character got it from. But yet again, it's like, what was the necessity to have Eric Roberts in the film outside of having this grand ensemble cast. Now a character that stood out to me that was an underlying current probably for the first two acts in the movie was Flea. Flea of the Red Hot Chili Peppers. That dude tied a lot of what was happening in the first two acts together. And then in the third act, he gets lost in the sauce until I think midway through the third act where he had like a couple of lines here and there and then that was it. So you lost that connective tissue. I just... You get lost halfway through the second act. 
the unnecessary parts of the Tobey Maguire scenes. Um, that killed me. The ending of this movie and to understand where everybody ended up from the story standpoint. It was sad. It ties into historically what you would have read in newspapers about stars in that time and era. So it made historical sense. Suicides, dying of overdoses, things of that nature, right? Not telling you who did or what happened to who. Watch it on your own if you ever feel like it. I am not recommending this film. I just feel like the story, it ended where we were supposed to feel and see this movie through the eyes of Diego Calva's character, Manny Torres. We ended up there. But everything around him, a lot of the time, superseded uh, what was going on with his character. It, it really became something where a lot of what was happening with the other characters didn't necessarily enrich what was happening with Manny in the movie. There was a lot of, there was a lot of disconnect. Yet at certain points you felt there was connection. But by majority the disconnected pieces is what really took me out of the film. Like the individual scenes a lot of the time they made they made for good theater, right? But yet again, I reiterate, it didn't add to the grander story. Let me mention something else that bothered me about the movie. And I'm going to leave politics out of this because there was no real politics in the f in the film but something that was uncomfortable and I'm not too sure how those who've watched the movie felt about this but Joe Von Adepo played a character by the name of Sidney Palmer Sidney Palmer was a musician um trumpeteer I guess you can say leader of a jazz band, right? Who eventually became the star of his own show and things of that nature. Eventually you get to this part with Sydney where the majority of the story was basically, the majority of Sydney's story was watching his rise right and how Manny was helping or just helped Sydney get to this star level point where he was no longer just a black man living in Hollywood from gig to gig he now had he got to a point where he had money a big house expensive cars everything else in between all the wealth a black man would want. Any man. Forget a black man. Any man. But I say the black man part because there's a scene in this movie, yet again, that I said, make me uncomfortable. They were on set. They were shooting a particular episode of the show. Uh, the spotlight was shone on to Sidney Palmer. 
And it came to be that Manny, who was producing the show, had to ask Sydney to put on blackface. A black man had to put on blackface because the light that was being shone on him made him look of a lighter skin tone than the rest of his black band. It made me feel uncomfortable because it came to a point where Sydney had to put on the blackface. I would have thought they could have alluded to it and not necessarily had the image or the image of it in the movie. But for him, for the actor to take the liberty to put on the blackface just so that we can feel the moment and feel his angst against him having to put it on. I understood the emotional tie to how it was supposed to make the audience feel. But it was very off-putting in a negative way. And in the movie's story, after that happened, Sid, he didn't walk off the set, but after that particular shoot, he never came back, left the keys to the house, the cars, and everything else in between. And he went back to what he knew, playing gigs in small cl clubs in front of small audiences. Because he felt disrespected. As a viewer, I felt disrespected to have to have a black actor do that in 2022. I felt was a bit much. You can call me uh, overly sensitive or whatever have you. But I thought that was unnecessary. You could have alluded to it. It could have been implied. But to have to show it, yet again, objectively understanding what Damien Chazelle was trying to do and trying to get the, that visceral and emotional effect out of the viewer, it was more of a turnoff than anything else. Um, it worked a lot like uh, the Tobey Maguire scenes that I spoke about earlier, where it just, it didn't hit. And it hit in a very negative way, um, which added to why uh, I wouldn't recommend this film. Just unnecessary imagery in this day and age. Like it's in our past, we knew it happened, but to have it replayed in a film in 2022, understanding all the some of the parts and people being okay with it and the actors wanting to, you know, delve into their art and all that. Understandable. Still. Didn't hit. And that sucked for me. Because this this is a film that I was really looking forward to and I thought I was really gonna like. Like I said, highly ambitious film. Something where there were a lot of great comedic moments. Um, there were a lot of great visual moments. I think that the, the sound design was good, but at times just a little bit too loud and I would figure that's probably how it played back then I'm not too sure if the speakers in the theater were just turned up too high or whatever but uh, at times it was a little turned off just by the loudness of it um, and I love to listen to music but I have never had the 
I've never had the feel to blare my music at the mountaintop peak to get a point across. So, yes, Roaring Twenties and everything else involved just didn't hit. I'm sure that the score in the soundtrack will be loved because of the, of the uh, not the volume of the sound, but the sound itself as to reflecting the times and giving the feel of the overall film. That was great. The volume, not so much. So, yet again, something that played against this film. I think this has been my longest talk and longest review so far. I want to thank everybody for listening to my review of Babylon today. Programming note going forward, just so everybody knows, I will be dropping my reviews every Monday from now on. So every Monday of every week, I will upload my, or at least the reviews will be uploaded to your podcasting application of choice, be it Apple, Pandora, tuned in, Spotify, Deezer, Stitcher, whatever you listen to, whatever you listen to on to this now, it'll be up on Mondays. So that is that, folks. I got another movie to watch tomorrow, Saturday. I will be watching I Want to Dance with Somebody, the Whitney Houston biopic. And then next week, before the New Year's in, I will attempt to get a watch in at a new theater for me. The, I want to say it's called the Angelica, or it can be the Angelica. I'm not too sure how it's pronounced. The Angelica Film Center down in Soho. Um, this is a particular movie theater and film center that plays independent films and what they call art house films. So this is the only theater where I can view um, the two movies that I want to watch next week Living and The Broker so hopefully by the day after the new year I'll have those reviews up for you guys and everything else in between I might have an extra review for you guys for this week I'll see what I can do on Sunday I'll keep that in the in the chamber But as always, folks, until next time, this has been your friendly neighborhood moviegoer, John L. Signing off. Appreciate you. Check you out on the next one. Thank you. Folks, addendum here. Uh, I forgot to mention the whole Rotten Tomatoes thing. So I will be adding this in for some context, I usually use this uh, to describe the overall picture between, in comparison between critics and the moviegoer. As of right now, the critic score is at a 55% at 195 reviews, and the audience score is at a 70 with over 100 verified ratings. So this movie, I think, uh, just from those raw numbers, is as divisive as I would have thought it to be coming out of the theater with the way that I felt. So I wanted to give you guys that for context, just so you understand that I'm not the only one who thought that this movie was all over the place and things didn't uh, coalesce well by the end of the movie. So with that being said, 
I'm not great at audio editing, folks. So this is just going to be added to the end of everything. Appreciate you for listening. My apologies for the added part. Peace.